I'm Earl Howard and I'm doing a performance at Roulette on September 25th. I'm sharing the concert with Evan Parker, the noted saxophone player and composer. And I'm doing solo saxophone and synthesis uh, pieces. Also, I will have the great and wondrous J.D. Perrin performing with me, who's playing bass flute. I'll be doing granular synthesis with JD, amplitude modulation, I'll filter him. I'll do all kinds of things, but the main thing is is that he'll know what I'm, if I if I'm doing a kind of resonance filtering where I'm going to be emphasizing various harmonics that he's playing or adding harmonics to what he's playing I'll have him be playing uh, multiphonics that have predictable harmonics and so we can rehearse. He'll either imitate me or respond to me or contrast with me depending on what uh, the circumstances are in the composition. And so he will know the process and he will play with it and I will play with him and that's what makes the live process different from the passive process where someone just plays through a delay or a filter or some other electronic processing device. The device will be processing him but I will also be playing all those processes. I can play all the parameters of the various processors and I can transpose him while we're playing. Maybe I would change it to thirds, or maybe I would break what he was doing apart and play a whole counterpoint to what he had just played with his voice, and then he would have to respond to that. But we'd work those kinds of things out. So that's the, the difference between the live process and the passive process one new piece I'll be doing. It's called ML70 for Mary Lucier, and it's um, a solo synthesizer piece. Um, it's in lots of sections. It has it has lots of it has um, it's a textural transformation so it has stochastic textures and polyrhythmic sex textures and melodic textures and there's a uh, there's a structure of development that has to do with the association between events having to do with how they accumulate and become a crowd and and then become separate and stand alone and then become a crowd again so and so you have the shifting texture that changes its density over time and its density in space and the spaces change sometimes the spaces are very reverberant and cathedral like sometimes the spaces are very small and so there's a uh, tension, a kind of modulation between largeness and smallness, and between density and sparsity, and between melody and non-melody. So there are lots of, of contrasts. However, I don't want to imply that it's always an are there or sort of thing. It's not. The, you know, these things all slip in and out of each other. And there are lots of stories that happen at once. I've been doing electronic music for since um, the late 70s. I've developed lots of ways of building sounds that were orchestrated to go with the instruments that um, we're playing with with them. Um, 
I've always made all my own sounds from scratch and so I've worked for years to develop orchestrated sounds that are rich and, and can play with other instruments. And there are lots of different kinds of narrative forms that you could lay out, you know, for the musician. And then you want to break that apart. You want to take that narrative, whatever it was, and start breaking those parameters apart. You, in other words, you want to start playing pieces of the whole that you created. And you want them to start thinking that way. Even if they're not executing it exactly, what they're thinking about is, right now I'm playing a whole thing, now I'm playing the parts of that whole. And then what you do with the process is actually take samples that are parts and give them back to them. And so if they know what that process is and they're themselves doing that process, you can have an interesting um, um, relationship that's based on the associated, a shared set of associated ideas.